All right, if you want to turn to, I guess, Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Second Peter chapter one. And uh, so we're going through the acronym closer in Robbie's book, um, how to be, you know, growing up, how to be a disciple who makes disciples. The C stands for communication. Of course, that's talking about prayer. Well, the L in closer stands for learn. And of course, he's talking about learning from Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, and it, it was Jerome that said, you know, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. And how many times have we heard that excuse? Somebody say, man, I just, I don't read the Bible because I just can't understand the Bible. And he's a pretty popular excuse for somebody who, you know, doesn't read the word of God. But it's one of the most genuinely untrue statements that a genuine believer can make. And we have to remember that your relationship with God and your relationship with the Bible is inseparable. You can't have one without the other. God has revealed himself to us in his word. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no way we can know God apart from the word of God. There's no way we can know the word of God is, is in that respect is also sufficient. And that means everything we need to know about God is in the word of God. And, and for the Christian life, that, that life and how to live that life is contained in the pages of Scripture. It is in God's Word that we grow up in every way into Him, as it says in Ephesians. Scripture completely equips us and, and makes us competent for every good work that God has created us to do. And there's no way that we can be a true disciple apart from the Word of God. You cannot grow without the Bible. You know, it's a lie of the devil that you can't understand the Bible. Uh, why would God go through so, so much supernatural means to, to give us His Word and preserve His Word for us if we weren't able to understand it? But yet there are still sincere believers that, that they feel intimidated, especially newer Christians. They feel intimidated to open up the Bible and read the Bible. They ask questions like, you know, how can I understand the Bible? How can I know what the Bible really means? How do I study the Bible? Well, we're going to talk for just a few minutes about that tonight. There are two dangerous extremes that exist in the church when it comes to the understanding of the meaning of Scripture. You've got one extreme over here where, you know, for thousands upon thousands and, and, and century upon century, some people have taught that ordinary people like me and you can't understand the Bible. That God has to send a special representative who's the head of the church in order to convey to us what the Bible says. So there's no point in us having a copy of it because we wouldn't be able to understand it anyway. That's one side of the spectrum. There's another side of the spectrum. And those are people that teach that the Bible has no definite meaning. It's, it's completely set subjective. Whatever it means to you is what it means. However you're feeling when you read it is what it means that day. Whatever, uh, you, know, whatever uh, you think at the time, that's what it means. And it could mean something different for me. And it could mean something different from, for you. It could mean something different for everybody. And those are the two sides of the spectrum. I hear that all the time. Well, that's your interpretation of it. And, and the simple truth is, in Scripture, God meant what He said, and He said what He means in Scripture. Every word of every verse of every chapter of every book has meaning that God gave when He breathed it out to the human writers and penmen of Scripture. If you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, 
But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. The truth is that we can know what God means in any passage of the Bible. Now, Christ has given the church pastors. Christ has given the church teachers to help us understand the word of God. And and that's a good thing. But the Lord also gave each one of us an even greater gift than a teacher. He gave us an even greater gift than a pastor. He gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that is our helper, that helps us understand Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. Combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Because they are spiritually appraised. We receive the Holy Spirit upon salvation. We know that that Holy Spirit indwells us. We know that Holy Spirit was was in our bodies. We are the temple of God because we house the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us that one of the most valuable things that he gave us is the Holy Spirit. It's the comforter that he sent to us. And he said that comforter will guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us. Because of this, we can understand the Bible for ourselves. But you see, we have a task in front of us. Every time we open up the Bible, we have a task. We need to arrive, we need to look at a passage of Scripture, and we need to arrive at the true meaning. What did God, what is He saying to us? Because this is an ancient book that was written 2,000 years ago to another culture, to another people in another language. And we need to, we actually need the Holy Spirit to help teach us the words of God. We need to arrive at the intended meaning that God had for the passage that we are reading. Now, fancy word for this, for the scholarly people, is hermeneutic. Isn't that just a fancy word? Don't that make you just want to put on a bow tie? Hermeneutic. And all a hermeneutic is just a fancy word that says explain or interpret. It's actually taken directly from a Greek word. It's a verb form that Jesus used when he was teaching the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Luke 27, 24, 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained. That word explain there, that's where we get the word, the Greek word. That's where we get hermeneutic from. He explained to them the things concerning himself in the scriptures. And, and we just want to make sure that when we study the word of God, it's our, it's our goal to draw out the meaning of the text and not to force our own understanding into it. Remember, anytime you approach the word of God with a presupposition or a philosophy that you won't allow the Bible to change, then the Bible's not informing you anymore. You're informing the text. So you need to come to the Bible pliable. You need to come to the Bible, say, 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 Bible, I'm going to read you. Nobody can change my beliefs except for this book. This book is the only thing that can change my beliefs. But we have presuppositions and we have philosophies that were taught to us in our custom and our culture and by our grandparents and our parents and the past that we had when we were nine. And, and sometimes it's not all correct. Anytime you get something from a human... The only only truth we have is the word of God. See, we need to allow the word of God to change us. Okay. now that's not to say that many different passages can't be applied in different ways. Every verse has many, many different applications. You can take a verse and you can apply it in many, many different ways. But make no mistake. 
Every verse only has one meaning. Every verse only has one interpretation intended by God. Our number one priority when interpreting Scripture is context. Context, context, context. Many people mistakenly think that it's the reader's perception of the biblical text that defines its meaning. And nothing can actually be further from the truth. It's the cardinal rule of Bible interpretation. The meaning of the text is established through what the author originally intended. And this author, this writer, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, established the meaning of the passage the day that he wrote it. Our role, mine and your role as students of the Bible. And if you're a Christian, that's what you are. You are a student of the Bible. Our jobs as students of the Bible is to uncover and peel back the layers and see what the original author intended to communicate to his original audience. What was he saying and who is he saying it to? The primary key to understanding the intended meaning of a verse is to identify the context. Context is the setting in which it was spoken and written. It means you're going to have to not only read the verse, it means you're going to have to read the verse before. You're going to have to read the verse after. You might have to read five verses before. You might have to read five verses. It might be better if you just read the whole chapter. Sometimes you got to read the chapter before and the chapter after to understand the context of the verse. For instance, in order to understand John 3.16, probably going to have to read John 3.15. Probably going to have to read John 3.17. In fact, it would probably be better if you read the whole chapter of John, whole third chapter of John. And you can take it a step further and even think about who it was Jesus was speaking to. Who was his audience? Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus was somebody who, who, who lived and breathed the law. And Jesus is showing this legalist that his salvation is not of works. That his salvation is of faith. And it brings, sheds new light on the verse when you know that. All scripture is connected. All scripture is woven together. Every verse of the Bible is connected to the verses around it. To the book that it appears in. To the testament in which it was given. And the message of the Bible as a whole. The Bible is univocal. The Bible speaks with one voice. I can look at a picture of a little girl holding an umbrella in the rain. Think, oh, isn't that cute? What a cute little girl. And then I back out, and it's a box of salt. Now, I wouldn't have known it was a box of salt if I didn't take a step back and look at the bigger picture. I just thought it was a little girl holding an umbrella in the rain. When you interpret scripture, you have to zoom out far enough to get the whole picture. You need to know what the original author was trying to communicate to his original audience. We fail to understand the context of a verse most of the time. We're going to misunderstand the verse. Religions, whole religions, doctrines, whole belief systems are built on verses and statements that have been taken out of its original context. So what we're going to do tonight very quickly is we're going to go over a Bible study method. This is the inductive Bible study method. It's got three parts. Okay, here it is. It's first step observation. Observation is the first step. You need to familiarize yourself by the t with the text. And how you familiarize yourself with the text is you read it, and then you reread it, and then you reread it, and guess what? You read it again. G. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan, who pastored Westminster Chapel in London, he once said that he would read a book 50 times before he put a pen to paper to write a sermon. 
Now you may ask, how many times do I have to read the text? The answer to that is as many times as it takes for that to really sink in to your spirit. For you to really soak in that scripture. And then once you, at, once you are familiar with it, then you need to ask some basic questions about the passage. Here's some example questions you can ask. Who is the author? Who is the recipients? Who are the main characters involved in the text? What's happening in the text? What's the author trying to communicate? What are the key words of the text? What is the context of the verse? Are there any comparisons in the verse? Are there any contrasts in the verse? What events are taking place? Where do the events take place? Why do the events take place? Why was the text written? How did these events occur? See, in observation, you're like an investigator. You're collecting evidence for a case. You're at the scene of a quote-unquote crime. And you're gathering all the evidence. You got to make sure you don't overlook anything. Because in the next step, you're going to examine your findings. So you just make a note of as many facts as possible that you can. So that's the first step of this Bible study method is observation. The second step is explanation. What does the text mean? Observation and explanation. In the second step, you're going to study the facts that you gather during the observation stage. And as you study these facts, truth will begin to come out of these facts. And this, this truth, it's called a theological principle. And, and, and you need to make sure that the principle is reflected in the text. Like the, the Bible actually says this. The truth that you get it needs to be timeless. Not attached to a specific situation. You know, you can't read, don't mix your fabrics and apply that to you because you're not an Old Testament Jewish priest. So it's, it doesn't apply to you. It's, it's not timeless. Things like that. The principle needs to not be bound by culture. It needs to match up with the rest of the Bible. It needs to be relevant. Not, not only relevant to the audience it was originally written to, but relevant to a contemporary audience, relevant to me and you. This stage, you can ask a few more questions. Robbie wrote down a, a few questions you can ask. What do the key terms mean? How do the verses and phrases relate to each other? How does this passage fit into the larger story of the book that it's written in? How does this passage relate to the story of the Bible as a whole? How does this passage speak of Jesus Christ? That's, a, that's one of my favorite questions to ask in the Old Testament. I read the Old Testament. I play Where's Waldo? I'm looking for Jesus in there. Because he said this, is, you know, this, this, this was written of me. What are the differences between the biblical audience and me? Get yourself a good bit, uh, Bible dictionary. Robbie recommends the uh, Harper Bible Dictionary. And that is a good one. I've had a Harper before. And here's the last step. Application. Application. And the question is, how does the text apply to me? The Bible is not just a book to be learned. The Bible is a book to be lived. God has something to say to you when you read His Word. When you practice the truth that you mine, it's like mining for gold. And when you get those nuggets of gold, you practice the truth that you mine out of the Bible. It makes a difference in your life. You don't get the gold and set it on the shelf. Oh, look at my pretty gold. No, you cash it in. You spend it. You get that truth out of the Bible. You have to be able to apply it. I love John MacArthur. Oh, I get so much out of John MacArthur. I love listening to him preach. It's just so much wisdom pouring out. But he said that he doesn't always do application when he preaches. That's not, he'll just give you the facts. And, but me personally, I love to find a way to apply that truth 
that you find in the Bible because it's like not applying it. It's like putting gas in a car and then not cranking it up. Okay, I love application. When we apply the Bible, we focus on God's truth upon our specific life related situations. The Holy Spirit helps us understand what we've learned. You see, we got to do more than just identify the truth of Scripture. The goal of, of reading the Bible and learning from the Bible is not just the accumulation of knowledge. We're not just fact collectors. We're here to learn lessons. What, did the, what does the book of James say? Be doers of the word, not hearers only. See, our ultimate goal when we read the Bible, the whole point of reading it is not to check off your, your checklist that day. It's not to get your little, you know, your little Bible app and, and listen to the Bible read for you. And at the end of the day, you get your little thumbs up from your Bible app another day down. We'll see you tomorrow. That's not the point of reading the Bible. The point of reading the Bible is to become more like Christ. Every time you re read the Bible, every verse you read, every chapter you read, the point is for me and you to become more like Christ. Everything in our life works to accomplish this. It is essential that we apply what we learn in God's word to help us be more like Jesus. When you learn, see, there are amen in me back there. They, they hear me preaching. They just, they can't, you know, it's just the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's essential that we apply what we learn in God's word to help us be more like Jesus. When you learn the truth in the Bible or from the Bible, ask yourself, how can this truth change my life? What can you do differently because of what you got out of your devotions today? Let me give you a few example questions here. Is there an application already in the text? Is there a command or an exhortation in the text that you read that you should live? What does the biblical principle mean today? What would the application of the verse look like in my life? Like if I apply this to my life, what would change? What difference does this make in my life? How can this biblical principle help me in my walk with God? You, me, we need the Holy Spirit's help in this entire process. And it's the Holy Spirit that illuminates our minds and guides us to the truth of Scripture. Let me read one last verse to you. This is one of the best verses that I've found to really communicate this. And it's 1 John 2, 27. As for you, the anointing which you have received from him, that's the Holy Spirit, abides in you. You're in dwell with the Holy Spirit. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. Oh, I don't need a priest. I don't need the Pope. I don't need the bishop. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Man, just that verse really jumped out at me today because I never really kind of I've read that verse before. But man, I've never really read it before. It speaks to what we're talking about today. So remember you study the Bible and this is about discipleship because as the, when we if when we ever do when you get some disciples to disciple and that's the point the point of us going through this book week after week Wednesday after Wednesday Wednesday is for us who's in here to not only make sure we're correct disciples but for us to pick people in our church in our community and us disciple them. My goal in this is to see discipleship groups birthed out of this study. That's the point of what we're doing. And in order to do that, you got to study the Bible. You got to teach others how to study the Bible. You got to teach a brand new Christian how to study the Bible. You have to teach them to observe, read the Bible, observe. What does it say? Explanation. What does it mean? Application. How does it apply to me? I'm teaching this to you so one day you 
can teach it to a baby Christian and disciple them. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the teacher. Thank you for the comforter, the advocate, Lord, that you've given us, Lord, that was given to the church on the day of Pentecost as, as, as cloven tongues of fire. Lord, thank you that we have that holy anointing. It's good to have a pastor. It's good to have a teacher, Lord, but we don't need it. We got the Holy Spirit. It's a good thing. It's a good thing to have a pastor. It's a really good thing to have a teacher. It's in your will. But Lord, we can teach ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to remember that when we read the Bible, we're not just reading it to check it off a checklist. Just to say we've done it. So we can finish our yearly plan. But when we read the Bible, we're mining for gold. Not that we can put on a shelf and admire but that we can cash in and spend and change our lives. Help us, help, help these principles to sink into us that when we do go into a discipleship group, Lord, we can teach these principles to younger Christians, Lord, to baby Christians, that they can become disciples. So the process can repeat itself. Thank you for this method, for the word of God for tonight. Bring us back at your appointed hour. In Jesus Christ, precious name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed.